Bruce Lee, the iconic martial arts maestro and Hollywood sensation, continues to captivate audiences worldwide, even 50 years after his untimely death. Despite his unparalleled speed and wisdom, rumors and mysteries still surround his legacy since his tragic passing at the age of 32. Now his daughter, Shannon Lee, steps forward explaining the controversies and revealing the true essence of her father. Join us as we delve into the real story behind the legendary Bruce Lee, beyond the glitz and glamour of the silver screen. Bruce's start in two very different worlds. Bruce Lee was born with the name Lee Jun Fan in the city of San Francisco, California, during the year 1940. His parents were there as part of a traveling opera group from Hong Kong. His dad, Lee Hoi Chuan, was well known back in Hong Kong for his roles in Cantonese opera, a traditional form of Chinese theater. Bruce's mom, Grace Ho, came from a rich family with a mix of European and Asian roots. Just a few months after Bruce was born, his family went back to Hong Kong. This was where Bruce spent his early years. They lived pretty comfortably because of his dad's success in the entertainment world. But things took a tough turn when Hong Kong was taken over by the Japanese army during the Second World War from 1941 to 1945. The Lee family, like many others, faced really tough times. They had to deal with not having much and living under the strict control of the Japanese army. But after the war, things started to get better when the Japanese left and Hong Kong began to heal. Bruce's dad picked up his opera career and this helped the family live a better life again. Despite the family's improved circumstances, school was a struggle for young Bruce. He was full of energy and didn't do well sitting still in class. He first went to LaSalle College, but didn't do well there. Hoping for a change, his parents moved him to another school, St. Francis Xavier's College. But Bruce still had problems. He started getting into a lot of fights with other kids, especially those in gangs. Seeing their son in trouble so often, Bruce's parents thought he needed something to focus on, something that would teach him discipline. They decided to get him into martial arts and found him a teacher named Yip Man, who was a master in Wing Chun Kung Fu. But starting wasn't easy. In those days, some Chinese were not keen on teaching their martial arts to someone who wasn't fully Chinese like Bruce, who was part European. But thanks to a good friend who spoke up for him, Bruce was allowed to learn. Even then, Bruce had to face problems because of his mixed background. Some students didn't want to train with him when they found out about his European heritage. But Bruce didn't give up. He kept learning from Yip Man and a few others who didn't mind his ancestry. His skills got better really fast. By the time he was 18, Bruce was already winning against older fighters in big boxing events in Hong Kong. But his success came with a downside. His constant fights, whether in the ring or on the streets, worried his parents a lot. They saw his potential, but were concerned about his safety and the direction he was headed. After a serious fight where Bruce Lee defeated a member from a rival group, his parents decided it was time for a change. They were worried because Bruce was getting into too much trouble, especially with the law. They thought it would be best for him to leave Hong Kong. With his 19th birthday just around the corner, they planned for him to go to the United States, hoping he'd find better chances there and stay out of trouble. Bruce's older sister, Agnes, along with some friends of the family, had already made a life for themselves in San Francisco. This made San Francisco a good starting point for Bruce. He moved there, but it was just the first stop on his journey. After a short time, Bruce decided to move again, this time to Seattle. His goal there was clear, finish high school. While in Seattle, Bruce lived with different friends, helping him to settle into this new chapter of his life. He worked various small jobs to earn his keep and stayed busy. But Bruce wasn't just focused on work and school. He also dedicated a lot of his time to martial arts. It was in Seattle that he started to develop his unique style of fighting. He mixed his Wing Chun skills with other martial arts techniques he picked up along the way. Bruce began sharing his knowledge by teaching martial arts. His first students included Jesse Glover, who would become a trusted assistant instructor, and a group of judo practitioners introduced to him by his friend and mentor, James Yim Lee. This was just the beginning of his journey as a teacher. By 1961, Bruce had taken a significant step forward by opening his own martial arts school in Seattle. He didn't stop there. He also enrolled at the University of Washington. He chose to study philosophy and drama, fields that interested him deeply and influenced his martial arts and teaching style. 
However, Bruce was so passionate about martial arts and teaching his own techniques that he couldn't focus on college. Eventually, he made the difficult decision to drop out and dedicate himself entirely to martial arts and developing his new technique, Jeet Kune Do. In 1964, Bruce's martial arts skills were recognized, and he was invited to demonstrate his abilities at the Long Beach International Karate Championships. This event was a turning point for him. He showcased his now famous one-inch punch, where he stood close to volunteer Bob Baker, and with his fist just an inch away, delivered a blow that sent Baker flying backward into a chair. The impact was so strong that Baker claimed he was in too much pain to go to work for several days after. Around this time, Bruce also faced Wong Jack Man, a respected Kung Fu master from San Francisco's Chinatown, in a highly publicized fight. The fight was fueled by controversies, particularly Bruce's open attitude toward teaching martial arts to non-Chinese students, which Wong disagreed with. While the exact details of the fight remain debated, Bruce's victory was undeniable. It not only strengthened his reputation, but also affirmed his belief in teaching martial arts to anyone, regardless of their race or background. This fight was more than just a personal victory. It was a statement about Bruce's principles and the direction of his martial arts philosophy. Now we move from street brawls to stardom as Bruce Lee fights his way to the top. Bruce's characters turn to fortune and fame. In the middle of the 1960s, Bruce Lee had made quite a name for himself as a martial artist. People were drawn to him because he was so good and his style was different. He called his special way of fighting Jeet Kune Do, which means the way of the intercepting fist. People really wanted to learn this from him. Then something big happened. A man named William Dozier, who made TV shows in Hollywood, saw Bruce Lee do an amazing show of his fighting skills at a big event in 1967. This event was the Long Beach International Karate Championships. Dozier was so impressed that he asked Bruce to try out for a part in a new TV show called Number One Son. This show was going to tell the stories of a character named Charlie. But let's step back a bit and see how Bruce got to this point. Before Dozier asked him to audition, Bruce had already been getting some attention for small acting parts he'd done. The big break came in 1966 when he was 25 years old. Bruce landed a big role on a TV show called The Green Hornet. He played a character named Kato. This was a huge deal because many people in America had never seen Hong Kong style martial arts before. Bruce was very serious about his fighting style. He didn't want to fight like Americans did on TV. He wanted to use his own moves, which were based on Wing Chun, a kind of martial art. But his moves were so fast, they had to film them in a special slow way so people could see what he was doing. On the set of film, The Green Hornet, Bruce met another Bruce, a stuntman. They became friends and shared their knowledge about fighting. Although The Green Hornet was only on TV for one season, it made Bruce Lee known to more people and set the stage for him to become a star. When The Green Hornet was taken off the air in 1967, Bruce Lee found himself without a clear path forward. He wasn't getting much acting work, so he decided to open a martial arts school in Los Angeles. He called it the Jun Fang Gong Fu Institute. There, Bruce started thinking differently about martial arts. He used to follow traditional styles, but now he thought they were too strict and not useful for real fights. Bruce liked the idea of being able to change and adapt. He didn't want to stick to one way of fighting. He began picking the best moves from all kinds of fighting styles. At his new school, he worked hard on creating and improving Jeet Kune Do. This new approach was groundbreaking. Bruce mixed things from Wing Chun Kung Fu, boxing, and even fencing into his fighting style. He was ahead of his time, teaching martial artists how to use weight training and get stronger, while also focusing on being fit and ready for real life fights. Bruce Lee started to become well-known in certain circles, especially among famous people in Hollywood. One of these people was a writer for movies named Sterling Sant. Sant really liked what Bruce could do and helped him get jobs setting up fight scenes in movies. He also helped Bruce get some small parts in TV shows and movies. In 1969, Bruce worked on the fight scenes for some movies called Marlowe and The Wrecking Crew. People could also see him in TV series like here Come the Brides and Blondie. But Bruce was not happy because he was only getting small parts. 
He thought Hollywood kept giving him these small roles because he was Asian. At the same time, he was trying to create new stories and ideas. He worked with his friend Sterling Sant and a famous actor, James Coburn, on a movie idea called The Silent Flute. Even though this movie wasn't made, Bruce learned a lot from the experience. By the time 1971 rolled around, Bruce was really unhappy. He was tired of only getting little roles that didn't let him show off what he could do. A man named Fred Weintraub, who helped make movies, gave Bruce some advice. He suggested that Bruce should go back to Hong Kong and make a big movie there. This way, he could show everyone in Hollywood how good he was. Bruce didn't know that back in Hong Kong, people already knew who he was. They had seen him in the, the Green Hornet, which they called the Kato Show. It was a big hit there, even though it was just a small part of Bruce's work. He talked to some big movie companies in Hong Kong, but in the end, he decided to work with a newer company called Golden Harvest. They agreed to make two movies with him. The first movie they made was called The Big Boss. In this movie, Bruce played a young man from China who moves to Thailand. The character discovers bad things happening, like illegal drug dealing, and decides to fight against it. This movie showed off Bruce's fighting skills and his deep thoughts about life. It was made with not much money, but when it came out, out it was a huge hit. All of a sudden, Bruce Lee went from being almost unknown to being a big star. People all over Asia wanted to see him in movies. This was the moment everything changed for Bruce. He was finally the main star, and he could show the world what he was capable of. At his peak yet facing hidden battles, let's see how Bruce Lee deals with fame and personal struggles. Bruce's internal struggles and battles. After the success of his first big movie, Bruce Lee was on a roll. He didn't stop there. Later in the same year, he acted in another movie called Fist of Fury. This time, he played the role of a student learning martial arts in Shanghai during the 1930s. His character was on a mission to find out who was responsible for his teacher's death. Bruce showed off his skills with very strong punches, big kicks that made wide circles, and cool moves with a pair of nunchaku, which are two sticks connected by a chain. Bruce did all the dangerous parts himself, making sure every scene was filled with strong feelings and deep thoughts, not just action. Just like his first hit, Fist of Fury made a lot of money and broke records, showing that more and more people loved watching him. In 1972, Bruce got the chance to make a movie exactly the way he wanted. This third movie was called The Way of the Dragon. Bruce did everything for this film. He came up with the story, directed it, produced it, organized the fight scenes, and of course, he was the main character. He played a skilled fighter protecting his relatives from bad people. In this movie, there's a very famous fight between Bruce and another fighter, Chuck Norris, inside a big old stadium. People think this fight is one of the best ever shown in movies because it looks so real and shows how strong and skilled they both are. The Way of the Dragon made even more money than his other movies, proving Bruce Lee was a huge movie star. Now famous all over, Bruce started his own company for making movies with a friend named Raymond Chow. The company was called Concord Production Inc. Their big project was a movie in 1973 called Enter the Dragon. This was a very special film because it was made with Hollywood's help by a big company called Warner Brothers. In the movie, Bruce Lee plays a fighter who goes to a big competition on an island to secretly find out what's going on there. Enter the Dragon was loved by people all around the world and made a lot of money. It made Bruce Lee a hero in martial arts and started a trend in where everyone was interested in Kung Fu. Sadly, just before Enter the Dragon was shown to the public, Bruce Lee died. He was only 32 years old. Even though he only made movies for a short time, Bruce Lee became famous all over the world. He changed how martial arts were shown in movies with new ways of filming and editing. He also showed that martial arts were not just about fighting, but also about understanding your feelings and thoughts. Bruce Lee's sudden death was a big shock, but his fame did not end. There was a movie he hadn't finished called Game of Death, and the people who made his other movies used doubles and parts of films that Bruce had already made to finish it. Years after he died, people still wanted to know more about Bruce Lee. They read his writings about how to be the best you can be and how to express yourself fully. His ideas on martial arts and how to live life were very special to many people, and they keep his memory alive. 
Bruce Lee was an incredible person who changed movies, connecting action films from Hong Kong with those in Hollywood in a way that had never been done before. His movies helped make the film scene in Hong Kong known all over the world and set the stage for other martial arts stars like Jackie Chan and Jet Li to become famous. He introduced new ways of showing fight scenes in movies that people still love and copy today. But Bruce's life also had its personal challenges, including issues with loyalty in his marriage. When Bruce was studying at the University of Washington, he met Linda Emery, who was also a student there. At that time, laws still prevented people of different races from getting married in many places, so they had to get married quietly without telling many people in August 1964. They had two children together, a son named Brandon in 1965 and a daughter named Shannon in 1969. However, Bruce Lee was just a regular person with flaws despite his fame. He sometimes found it hard to resist the attention and temptations that came with being famous and was not always faithful to his wife, Linda. There were many rumors about his relationships with other women, but Linda decided to ignore them instead of challenging them. For example, actress Sharon Farrell spoke warmly about her time with Bruce when he was at the peak of his popularity. But even with these challenges, Linda's love for Bruce did not waver. On the day Bruce Lee died, he was with another actress, Betty Ting Pai, which caused a lot of speculation. Despite this, Linda continued to defend her husband's memory after he passed away, showing the deep love they shared. Linda wrote a letter to address the exaggerated stories about Bruce's death, expressing that she knew the true character of her husband, beyond what was portrayed in the media. Their marriage had its difficult times, but she still remembers it fondly. Linda was heartbroken when Bruce Lee died suddenly in 1973 because of an allergic reaction. However, she has spent many years promoting his martial arts style, Jeet Kune Do, and taking care of his legacy. She worked very hard to keep his memory alive and share his teachings with the world. Under a legend's shadow, we'll see how Bruce Lee's family lived with his legacy and dealt with his sudden loss. The Lee family's biggest heartache. Linda Bruce Lee's widow wrote a very personal book about her late husband in 1975. This book shared many private details about Bruce's life and helped create the movie Dragon the Bruce Lee Story in 1993. Their son, Brandon, loved martial arts just like his dad. When he was little, he learned martial arts from Bruce himself and would often go to the places where his dad was filming. Brandon wanted to be like his dad and become a famous action movie star. He started acting in some movies, but then something very sad happened. In 1993, when he was only 28 years old, Brandon died because of an accident with a fake gun during the filming of a movie called The Crow. This was a strange and sad coincidence because his dad, Bruce, also died in unusual circumstances. Shannon, their daughter, was only four years old when her dad, Bruce, passed away. When she grew up, she learned Jeet Kune Do, the martial art her dad created from some of his students. Initially, she was more interested in acting, but as she got older, she started to focus more on martial arts. Shannon now runs the Bruce Lee Foundation, where she helps keep her father's memory and teachings alive. Although Linda, her mom, doesn't work at the foundation anymore, she still works hard, even in her late 70s, to remember Bruce and teach others about him. She thinks it's very important for fans and their family to understand who Bruce really was, not just as a strong film star, but also as a thoughtful and kind person. Linda, Shannon, and the Bruce Lee Foundation welcome new fans who admire Bruce Lee. These new fans, especially young people, are amazed by his movies and want to learn from him. They find out that Bruce was not only great at martial arts, but also a deep thinker and a loving family man. It's a big loss that Bruce's family lost him when he was becoming very famous. But despite this, his family continues to share his life story and achievements with the world. Bruce Lee's unexpected death at the young age of 32 has led to many rumors and theories over the years. Shannon, his daughter, works hard to find out the truth about her father's mysterious death while keeping his memory alive. Bruce was very famous in 1973, known around the world for his martial arts and for breaking new ground as an Asian actor in Hollywood. On July 20th, while at the home of actress Betty Ting Pei in Hong Kong, Bruce had a serious medical emergency after taking medicine for a headache. He was quickly taken to the hospital but sadly died soon after getting there. The doctors said he died because of cerebral edema, which means his brain had swollen up. 
This was likely linked to an earlier health scare he had two months before. The sudden passing of Bruce Lee, a very famous and loved actor, left everyone shocked and full of questions. People started making up stories about his life, saying he was involved in secret romances, had problems with drugs, was mixed up in mafia fights, or even cursed by his family. Newspapers and magazines wrote dramatic and shocking stories, suggesting Bruce's last night involved crazy parties or strange activities, which upset his wife, Linda. She had to stand up against these hurtful stories to protect her husband's good name. For Shannon, who was only four years old when she lost her dad, trying to keep his true story alive became her big challenge for the rest of her life. After Bruce Lee passed away, there was a lot of confusion. Raymond Chow, who worked with Bruce, first said Bruce was at home with Linda that night. Later, people found out that wasn't true and they started to think Bruce was having a secret love story with Betty Ting Pei, the actress he was with when he died. Fans were so upset some unfairly blamed her for his death. Many years later, Betty said she was scared, but there was never real proof they were more than friends. Still, people connected Bruce's name with Betty's forever, making things tough for her and Bruce's family. Then there were talks that Bruce died because of taking too much drugs. Doctors found a small amount of marijuana in his body, making others wrongly suggest he used lots of different drugs. Even though medical experts said these didn't cause his death, such talk made things even harder for Shannon, who was already missing her dad a lot. The real reason behind Bruce's sudden death might have been an allergic reaction to a medicine he took for pain, which had something called meprobamate in it. But this didn't stop people from coming up with their own stories. Some thought Betty Ting Pei had something to do with bad groups in China and was part of a plot against Bruce because he didn't pay some money he owed, or he was too big of a rival to other movie groups. Others suspected Raymond Chow had a part in Bruce's death, thinking he wanted to take over their movie business all for himself. All these wild guesses and stories have made understanding what really happened to Bruce Lee very complicated. For his daughter Shannon, this meant she had to face a lot of sad and unfair ideas about her dad while trying to remember him as the great person he was. Facing rumors and lies, Shannon Lee steps up to set the record straight and honor her father's true story. Shannon Lee versus deep controversies and embarrassing rumors. After Bruce Lee's unexpected passing, Raymond Chow, his movie business partner, stood to benefit a lot. He could now fully control and make money from Bruce Lee's famous movies, like Enter the Dragon and Game of Death. Some people even thought that Bruce Lee and his family were under a curse, pointing out that both Bruce and his son, Brandon, died in really unusual and sad ways. This idea comes up because Bruce's grandparents also lost a son before Bruce was born. Some say this is why both Bruce and Brandon faced early and similar tragic ends. But this idea of a curse doesn't take into account real life reasons, like the accident on the set of Brandon's movie, The Crow. For Shannon Lee, Bruce's daughter, fighting against these wild stories to protect her dad's real story has been a huge challenge. Shannon is the only one left to look after her father's work and memory. She works really hard to keep his good name and share his skills and ideas with new fans. Even though many years have passed since Bruce Lee died, there are still many crazy stories about him. Shannon has to keep setting the record straight, which is a big job. She doesn't like it when people spread false stories and would rather have her father remembered for his amazing personality, his hard work, and his martial arts wisdom. She wants to keep his memory alive in a good way by teaching others what he knew and stood for, which is like a valuable gift she's sharing with the world. Shannon Lee recently decided to talk openly in a big way about everything. She's ready to share her side of the story about her dad, Bruce Lee. It's been 50 years since he died in a shocking way. And Shannon wants to clear up all the wrong ideas that people have spread about her family. In a new interview, she talks about how her dad was really ahead of his time. He wasn't just about martial arts. He had deep thoughts and always wanted to get better, using strong principles in his daily life. Shannon admires how her dad used his mind just as much as his body, aiming to achieve his goals. She believes this is why so many people see him as a symbol of what humans can do when they really try, which is very exciting and inspiring. But Shannon has also had to deal with people who don't respect her dad's legacy properly. 
She was especially upset with Quentin Tarantino's movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he showed Bruce Lee in a way that made him seem full of himself. Quentin Tarantino said he was just being creative, but he kept saying things that made Shannon even more upset. She feels it's important to correct these wrong views and keep showing the true greatness of her dad, Bruce Lee. Shannon made it clear that in Quentin Tarantino's movie, Bruce Lee is shown losing a fight to a made-up character named Cliff Booth. But in real life, Shannon believes Cliff would have had no chance against her dad. Shannon explained that her dad was a true martial artist who really knew how to fight and had proven it many times. She's upset because she feels like the people making movies in Hollywood often just turn him into a typical kung fu character, ignoring that he was actually very skilled and real. Shannon was also really upset by how the movie seemed to suggest that her dad, being an Asian martial artist, wouldn't do well in a tough situation like a jungle, unlike the fictional character Cliff, who is shown as a war hero. She thinks this is unfair and kind of racist, as it suggests that an Asian fighter's skills are less valuable than those of a white stuntman. Shannon finds this especially strange because she knows Tarantino admired her dad's movies, like the ones used for inspiration in Kill Bill. Yet in his own film, Tarantino seems to ignore how good Bruce Lee actually was at fighting and doesn't respect his true story. Shannon believes Tarantino should have talked to her family and checked the facts before showing her dad in such a wrong way. She's also upset because some people say her dad was involved in illegal activities and drug problems. She's really tired of these false stories that connect her dad's death to criminal gangs, drug use, or secret love stories. She explained that her dad never used serious drugs and that many people ignore the real medical reasons behind his death, preferring to make it into a big dramatic story. In reality, her dad had a bad reaction to a common painkiller, not because of any scandalous behavior. Shannon feels that these false stories have hurt her family a lot. She spends a lot of time trying to correct these wrong ideas. Shannon is very committed to keeping her dad's real personality and beliefs alive rather than letting him be remembered for untrue and sensational stories. She wants to share his real teachings and the hard work he put into everything he did, showing how amazing he was. She's proud that, even 50 years after his death, people still see her dad as a symbol of what people can achieve at their best. But Shannon is worried because as more time passes, fewer people who actually knew her dad are around to tell his real story. This means that others could get his story wrong. That's why Shannon wants to tell everyone the real facts about her dad, Bruce Lee, and what made him truly special. Was Bruce Lee simply a martial arts master and film star? Or is there more to his story left untold? Share your thoughts and don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more.